Welcome back into the mental game where this week's guest is Robin Williams' son, Zach. For me, it's really about a continuation of our family's work. Um, in his case, he very much lived to entertain, to help people laugh, to help people learn. And in this episode, Zach opens up about his father's legacy in comedy and also his tragic suicide, but he also talks about his own personal mental health battle with depression and anxiety and also choosing to go sober in recent years. All of that and much, much more as we honor the great Robin Williams here on World Mental Health Day. But if you know someone that is struggling with their mental health, just asking them how they're feeling can sometimes make a big difference. You know, sometimes life can just be overwhelming and we have to help each other get through those tough moments. So if you know someone that's going through crisis, please visit the Ohio Suicide Prevention website at ohiospf.org and we can help everyone with their mental health. But now it is time for the latest episode here on The Mental Game with Robin Williams' son, Zach. <laughs> Welcome back into the mental game. And as you can see, I have a very special guest standing next to me, Zach Williams, son of the amazing, the great Robin Williams. Zach, thanks so much for coming on the mental game. Thanks for having me. It's good to be on. Yeah. And your, your story and your passion for mental health is something that is obviously personal to you after losing your father to suicide. Um, and I just love that you have taken a situation that is heartbreaking and tough and you've battled your own depression and anxiety um, and you've been able to make it your own story and help other people. It's very, very powerful. Um, and so I want to go through your childhood, um, your father's legacy um, and how you've battled your own mental health and depression throughout this interview. But the first thing I ask everyone in the mental game is what does mental health mean to them? And everyone has a different answer, whether it's something that they've taken care of their whole life or maybe there was events that made them take better care of their mental health. But I ask you the same thing. What does it mean to you? Well, for me, mental health means mental hygiene. Mm -hmm. Really what it comes down to is we need to take a lens around doing things for ourselves every day for our, our mind uh, and to nurture our sense of well-being. Yeah. And really what that comes down to is not framing mental health as a situation of crisis. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, we have a mental health issue, we need to more so focus on how mental health could be prioritized around prevention yeah. and everyday rituals that can support our well-being and, and general mindset. Yeah. And that's something for me, you know, with, with my story, I was, I think my first suicidal thought, I was 14. Um, last one was about a year and a half ago and I had to check in somewhere into a mental health hospital and get that help. And I just didn't have the tools or have the knowledge because in this world, we never really talked about it openly until I would say probably the last three to five years where it started to really gain traction to talk about it. Um, when did you realize the first time you maybe struggled with some depression and anxiety in your life? Well, I, I was never willing to admit it mm -hmm. uh, up until my 30s. Yeah. You know, I'm 40 now. And throughout my upbringing, I, I, I just thought this is what you have. This is yeah. what people have. This is our condition. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until I started acknowledging the stigma associated with mental health that, mm -hmm. I, that I started parsing out really what it was that I was dealing with. I'd been diagnosed with anxiety. I'd been diagnosed with trauma. Um, but I hadn't really fully acknowledged that there's ways to manage it yeah. versus just, hey, living with it. And that that's what you have to deal with. Right. And you mentioned like not Go seeking help or acknowledging it until your 30s. I think that's very common. Like I, like I said, 14 first suicidal thoughts didn't go to therapy, I think until 26. Um, and I'm patient zero. If I'm not going to get help, there's a lot of people that aren't. Um, throughout your childhood, what were things that maybe um, if you look back on made you sad or had some of those moments where they were tough on your mental health? Well, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in a reasonably normal environment mm -hmm. in San Francisco, in the Bay Area. And uh, 
I had a lot of social anxiety. Okay. And um, also for me, things like rumination, um, uh, thinking about the future. Yeah. Overemphasizing things that occurred in the past. Mm -hmm. For me, I didn't conflate it to a mental health condition. Yeah. I just conflated it to that's just how I'm thinking. Yeah. And, and you know, for me, depression was something that's not, not permeating every aspect of my life. There right. were bouts of depression. Yeah. And generally, those occurred when I wasn't taking care of myself. Yeah. And, um, I never made the connection. You take care of yourself, you're generally going to feel better. Right? Yeah. Um, it, for me, a large part of my adolescence leading into adulthood was all about coping, establishing mechanisms, whether it's self-medicating, using mm -hmm. things like alcohol, or actually looking at you know, ways to protect myself yeah. um, through various means. Yeah including stigma, establishing mm -hmm. stigma as a means of protection. And uh, when I started taking a deep look after, you know, my father died by suicide and I was experiencing a lot of dysregulation, I started parsing out the different elements of my life and lifestyle that were contributing to me feeling pretty crappy most of the time. Yeah. When you look at that, is do you think, like for me, Actually, tomorrow I'll hit eight months sober. I was a big drinker. Like just, it was always to numb the pain. And like, I just was, I called it autopilot because I just struggled so much with this alone feeling that I would just do, I would get done with shows after games and go out till three in the morning, get up, hung over, go do an interview, get through the rest of the day. And it was just rinse and repeat. Yep. Um, like self-medicating. Is that something that you struggled with? Yeah. Well, I mean, I use alcohol as a means of managing anxiety and stress and yeah. trauma for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it's been six years. Oh, wow. Congrats. Thank you. That's and, amazing. um, throughout that journey, the things that I've discovered about myself is that, you know, my alcohol use earlier on drug use and the like was, you know, managing the symptoms associated mm -hmm. with the anxiety, depression, the trauma. Yeah. And as I, as I learn more about myself, I realize that, you know, my experience first off, isn't unique. Yeah. Secondly, all the things that come from not taking care of yourself over a period of time, not loving yourself, uh, lead to things like resentment, mm -hmm. things like self-loathing, things like isolation. Yeah. When, when, when you started realizing that you needed to cut alcohol out of your life, cut different things that, you know, are, are bad coping mechanisms. You got to find healthy things for you. Um, when did you start going to therapy? When did you realize that it was a really, really healthy thing for you? Well, therapy is not something I've, I've act actively engaged in um, over my entire life. Yeah. I mean, yes, I've seen therapists right. and, and I've had great experience with therapists. Um, for, unfortunately, you know, in the case of many Americans, mm -hmm. therapy uh, was effective at times, but also ineffective. And, and what I found in talking to so many different people is also not accessible, especially yeah. quality therapy. And yeah. The stats that I've learned is that therapy is not accessible to folks. Um, quality therapy is not accessible 93% of the time. Yeah. You know, um, that leads to questioning certain considerations, right? Um, one is how do we make it universally accessible? Right. I think that's hard to do because you you need to train yeah you know, millions more therapists yeah right. One therapist can only handle so many folks in the, over the course of a week yeah. And the other thing too is um, you know when it comes to meeting with therapists and you're looking at how people are supported, often things like lived experiences are essential. Yeah. Not to say in every case, mm -hmm. folks can be trained to know how to manage certain situations or the like, but, um, you know, I think really what we need to take an approach around is how do we actually train and, and coach folks into mm -hmm. learning about how to support their peers. Right. And, and that's, it, it's a journey with the person that, you know, needs help and, you know, you and I, and people that are trying to um, you know, support as therapists, mental health professionals, psychiatrists, you know, I, I, 
when I checked in somewhere, I realized that, and this isn't discrediting the, the work that they do because, you know, they helped save my life, but a lot of it isn't rocket science or isn't this crazy formula. We're just never taught it. And our parents weren't taught it. Like we didn't hear about it in school with math, science, English. And I think just education and, and people realize, and this is something that we have to talk about. The stigma thing is huge for me. And I want to go back to your, your childhood upbringing and, and your father too, because if someone looks on the outside and sees Robin Williams, they see the smile, they see him in Goodwill Hunting and Mrs. Doubtfire, and you just see the, the pure joy in his face, but they might not know what that person is, is going through, you know, in their own heart and head with depression, with mental health. Um, did you know how bad he was struggling? Um, well, I, I think relative to his struggle, his struggle was very much the struggle of a lot of comics and entertainers, mm -hmm. right? This, this is, this is what many, many folks in the entertainment industry deal with yeah, and can't talk about. Right. So yes, he experienced depression, anxiety over the course, course of his life, trauma, things like that. But, um, you know, he, he had effective ways to manage it mm -hmm. and he got a lot of joy and healing from, going out, entertaining audiences, right. from being on set. Yeah. I, I, the, the, the irony of it all is the finished product is not something that, I mean, yes, he was proud of his work, but it's not something that he would watch or derive yeah. joy from. It was really about being immersed in environments where there's lots of folks who want to engage with what he has to say. Um, in terms of his mental health, Again, you know, he, he had effective ways of managing it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I learned more and more about the challenges that entertainers deal with, right. they have to put on a, you know, a smile. Mm -hmm. Now in this day and age, there's a risk of getting canceled, you know, going yeah. out and, and sharing things that might be on popular subjects or might, might not be the right can considered thing to say in a certain community and, and you know granted there yeah. are inappropriate things to say but um what i found in talking to comics and the like is that that's a very real fear yeah and it leads to you know i'd say a level of insecurity and um frustration that i hadn't seen prior right. like prior to a few years ago yeah um if I can pull back the curtain with you and your father's relationship, um, you guys were, were pretty close. I remember hearing another interview talking about loving walks with your dad and experiencing um, just the conversations you two had together. Um, did you guys ever talk about, you know, mental health? Was there things that, um, what, what do you f fondly remember about those, those conversations that you two had together? I mean, we, we were very interested and shared a passion for things like, science and yeah. new developments. He's very interested in current events. Um, in addition to new developments in technology, mm -hmm. he's very passionate around science fiction, okay, yeah. computer games and so yeah. forth. And so that we would spend a lot of time talking about that. Yeah. It, it's, um, it, it just, the pictures I look back on, um, there's one where you're very, I, when you lived in New York, when you were younger, correct? Uh, yeah, I lived there almost 12 years. Yeah, and there's a picture of him holding you as you guys are walking down the street. It's a very popular photo that I've seen out, and then obviously throughout the years, um, you guys look similar. The faces are there. Um, do you, what about um, your father's legacy and his role in your life inspires you today and, and keeps you, um, I mean, you're one of the biggest mental health advocates out there. You started a company because you want to help others. Um, how does your father inspire you to do that? I, you know, I, I think for me, it's really about a continuation of our family's work. Mm -hmm. um, in his case, he very much lived to entertain, to help people laugh, to help people learn. And, um, you know, that, that wasn't what I set out to do for me. I'm, I'm, very much focused on a healing journey yeah. and the discovery around that healing journey is that service is key. Mm -hmm. I need to be of service to others mm -hmm. to support myself. Um, but in order to be of service, you really need to take care of yourself. Right. So 
you know, there's, there's a, a legacy of giving back that yeah. I, I think is, is kind of part of our family's DNA. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't think I ever set out to do things to help others. Mm -hmm. I think really what it came down to is when it came to looking at the collective human condition, yeah, folks suffering, folks in need, um, folks seeking connection and evaluating our time here on this planet it's very clear to me that we all have an opportunity to help people find love for themselves, yeah. find meaningful connection. And there's no feeling like that in the world. No, when I mean, you can look at yourself in the mirror and have that self love and, and realize that things are going to be okay. And for me, I tell people two things when it comes to mental health. One, do something, you know, call, call your friend, call your mom, call your therapist, just please do something. And then number two would be feelings are temporary. You know, you might feel sad, depressed in this moment, and it might seem like it might not end, but I promise you, I've lived through it. You've lived through it. Like things can be okay. Um, you can get better. Um, I feel like you have a maybe you've discovered a new purpose in life. Like when you have that, the feeling to give back, like it feels like, over the last few years, you created PIM, which I want to give you, you know, obviously a platform to talk about that, but you, you want you have this new purpose to help each other or to help others that are struggling with their mental health. Where did that like sense and urge come from? You think it came from taking an introspective look at how I was taking care of myself mm -hmm. and the people I cared about. Yeah. Uh, not to say I'm necessarily a caretaker. Yeah. Um, we all assume that role mm -hmm. at times, but, um, I started looking at my relationship with things like stigma, yeah, the culture and the, and the families I'm a part of, um, historically how things like mental health were brought up and then even looking at, you know, my perception of that history. Yeah. Right. You know, for me growing up, you hear the word mental health and it's like, that's an institutional thing. Yeah. We grew up understanding or in my generation, mm -hmm. I think younger generations might not have the same type of perception, but in my generation, it's kind of the tail end of the institutionalization, mm -hmm. um, culture. Yeah. Which kind of started petering out for a number of reasons due to federal policy and so yeah. forth, but in the eighties, um, late seventies actually. But, um, you know, so, so that was a whole, that was a whole thing. Yeah. The cultural zeitgeist around it was there were asylums, Yep. you know, and, and that's kind of the, the apex of crisis culture. Yep. And, what? and so, but then you, what happened was you have a D incident, you have, you have a, uh, series of time where deinstitutionalization mm -hmm. occurs and, and then suddenly it's on a, you know, folks are on our streets in crisis and we're looking at things like different drug epidemics Yep. and suddenly crisis starts permeating our daily experience. Yeah. And then we're starting to tell ourselves, okay, well, you know, mental health is starting to become a thing that we're seeing on the streets. There's people in dysregulation, potentially with serious mental illness who need navigation or care. Mm -hmm. And, and I think at, uh, our collective perspective is evolving over time as we're starting to understand, Hey, you know, it's not just about folks on the street, folks in our family or like who are experiencing potentially serious mental illness or crisis. It's actually about our, our, our experience with yeah. anxiety and depression. And, and I think it's taken us some time, as you mentioned, you know, only about three to five years ago is this right. really started, um, kind of shifting, blossoming into the, the, our, our collective perception. Yeah. I mean, it had before, but there, there was some, some historical th 
things that contributed to it. Sure. The pandemic, mm-hmm. um, things like the opioid epidemic yeah. and, and other drug epidemics. Um, but I think on top of that, there, there's some underlying factors that are really contributing to um, stress overload and, and more manifestation of you know, mental health conditions cropping up. I yeah. think there's a, an overcrowding that's occurring, and that's not necessarily a physical overcrowding. We've had dense urban environments mm-hmm. for millennia. Uh, I, I really think it's actually a, a digital overcrowding. Yeah. Um, the way in which the, the mobile first generation interacts with things like social media, work. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very disjointed and very dense in terms of interactions, not necessarily quality or negative interactions. Mm-hmm. It's just a jumble and it's a jumble happening at a very high velocity. Yeah. And it's very, um, challenging for folks. I love everything that you just said. I'm trying to go back to, to a point that stuck with me, which is you saying that you had to take care of yourself or you realize you weren't taking care of yourself and that's when you struggle the most and, and that's kind of where that spark of wanting to help people with their mental health came from you've been sober six years now um your father passed just about 10 years ago after his suicide is that when you struggled the most with um alcohol abuse care- and that and taking care of yourself or um no i i think it was there was a few times in my life where I I struggled an equal amount Mm -hmm. um, or similar. That was probably actually, yes, it was the time of my life where I struggled the most, but there were similar times in my life. Um, Post September 11th actually was a very challenging time for me. I moved to New York in September of 2001. Um, I wasn't able to acknowledge the, trauma of living in New York in a post 9-11 New York yeah for a number of years because I I I didn't believe that I could acknowledge that I had a I was negatively impacted by that experience yeah the attacks and and the New York after that because I didn't know folks who passed in the towers and yeah you, you know I think there's a there's many folks I've spoken with who feel a similar way, Mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that, you know, there's a shooting or there's some sort of political event or like, um, that is really devastating to us. And yet it's hard to acknowledge, Hey, this, this is really impacting me in specific ways. Yeah. And, and I think we need to give ourselves a break and acknowledge Mm -hmm. the fact that it's like, Hey, this, this shit's hard. Yeah. And, and so, you know, for me, we all, we all have kind of primary operating procedures and, and alcohol was a primary part of that for a long time. Yeah. Cause it was a, it was a way, it was my way of coping. Have you noticed someone in your life just sad or angry or not being themselves recently? Maybe they're not hanging out with you and your friends or your family as much as they used to, or they're giving away things they care about, like money or pets. That person might be in a crisis, and that's where the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation can help them or help you become a suicide prevention advocate. Visit ohiospf.org to help yourself or your family or friends find resources to help save their life or help them with their own mental health. Look, I've been through my own battles with suicide, depression, anxiety. I am much, much better now because I started going to therapy and reached out to resources like they have at the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation. So please don't be afraid to ask for help. You hear Zach and I talk about how important it is to talk about how you're feeling and make that change for yourself or help somebody you know that might be struggling. There's self-awareness and it's so hard for, for some people that get stuck in those um, cycles or, or, you know, I didn't really think of it like this until my ex-girlfriend brought it up when she would see it, me go through it, um, which is like spiraling. And I would have episodes or, or moments in life where it would take me down drinking a lot. And I just, I just did the same thing, rinse and repeat. And I finally got to 
whenever it was eight, eight months ago when I stopped drinking of just like waking up one day, I'm like, I can't live like this anymore. I can't keep doing this to myself. And I, I guess I just one give you all the props in the world for, I don't know if you got to that same rock bottom as me feeling like that. I guess that's the question I ask you. How did you get to that turn to know, Hey, I got to cut this shit out. Well, I mean, it came down to a lot of off label usage of alcohol. Yeah. Um, you know, on, on beer or whatnot, it, you know, it says drink responsibly Yeah. or advertisements or yeah. what have you. And, and I, and I was, I was using alcohol in ways to, medicate mm -hmm. and the challenge with that is there's never enough yeah of those type of solutions to to quench the need yeah and when i stopped drinking i started realizing that i could manage my feelings in beyond healthier ways ways that actually help me better connect with folks yeah. improve my relationships not just improve how i was feeling yeah. But improve how the people around me are feeling. Yeah. You, um, you've spoken about family a lot, um, in our conversation. And I, I mentioned an old interview you did, I think with people magazine mm -hmm. where you had a photo shoot wife, kid there. Like it was just, it, it's so joyous to see you guys together. Um, how important is family to you? Well, I have a four year old son, Mickey and a two year, uh, two year old daughter, Zola mm -hmm. and my wife, uh, Olivia, whom, mean the world to me and we spend of course most of our time together yeah um i'm learning about myself a lot about myself as i go about parenting yep and then there's an element of reparenting associated with that mm -hmm. so for the parents out there especially those who might have experienced trauma throughout their lives and so forth there, there's there's a healing opportunity Sure. You know, and it, it by no means is it easy. It's, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. But it can be very, very healing. Yeah. And you said healing a few times just in that answer. Do you feel like part of your healing process with anything that you've gone through in your life, um, part of that healing process is helping people, whether it is your own family or I want to get into him here in a second, but people with their mental health, is that healing for you to help others? It is healing for me to help others. Um, personally, I don't necessarily go about wanting to fix people or wanting to um, even heal people as a objective. Right. Um, I found myself uh, having a great deal of pride in delivering education. Mm -hmm. I, I have surrounded myself with incredible psychiatrists, scientists, and uh, researchers, and often they're sharing everything that's going on on the cutting edge. And, right. and I think there's an incredible opportunity to really translate that into accessible ways of taking care of ourselves. I think if I have this right, you have taught in, in jails, right? You've helped inmates learn. Prison, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it financial responsibility or literacy? Financial literacy. What was that like? Because I find that really, really powerful and interesting. Well, you know, in the context of prisons, um, financial education is an incredible opportunity for folks mm -hmm. because really what it boils down to is it, it's, it's an incredible way to empower folks to establish ways to manage their own destiny. Yeah. The majority of crimes committed are financial related. Yeah. And when you spend time within the prison system, what you realize is there, there are incredible folks there generally in a position where they had a challenging upbringing. Mm -hmm. They, there's tons of trauma there. Yeah. There are folks who genuinely want to do great things, do the right things, who have wonderful relationships with family or so forth, but, but might have been in situations where they have not, did not have the tools or education to enable themselves to get that opportunity. Yeah. And it's all about opportunity. Yep. Right. And then on top of that, about self-management and, yeah. you know, personal management. 
Well, I, I love how you ha have made it part of your purpose to, to help others. And the main way that you're doing that now is with PIM. Um, can you just walk us through what PIM is? And it, it's very cool that, that, that it's something that's unique to you because we talked a little bit before we started rolling that maybe um, antidepressants or medications didn't work, weren't the best answer for you. Everybody has a different answer when it comes to their mental health and, and you found something that helps you, but also can help others. Yeah, so when I first stopped drinking, I was having a ton of anxiety and depression. Yeah. And my now wife, Olivia, who has a similar journey to mine in that her sister died by suicide when my wife was um, 10. Wow. And you know, she was traumatized by it and spent the better part of two decades working out solutions to support herself. And, and she introduced me to nutrition for mental well being mm -hmm. as a means of doing so. And uh, it was life changing for her. Yeah. And I was really skeptical of things like nutrition to support mental well-being. And, and she introduced me to a set of compounds, amino acid based. Mm -hmm. And I started taking them and was able to sort out my anxiety in uh, two days wow. and my depression in two weeks. Now that said, for me, um, there were certain ways in which I was conducting my lifestyle. I wasn't eating well, yeah. wasn't getting the type of exercise I needed. and so when I added a nutritional component, mm -hmm. it was very helpful for me. Yeah. And, and not everybody needs nutrition, but the majority of American adults are nutritionally deficient to support their neurotransmitter health. Yeah. <clears throat> so what that means just to, to break it down is we need to ingest the precursors of our neurotransmitters mm -hmm. um, that are ultimately synthesized into things like GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, yeah. uh, serotonin, dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, adrenaline, um, you know, that, which, which is the, the catecholamine system is, yeah. is a part of uh, it, which makes up the catecholamine system. And, uh, you know, we need to support endorphins, mm -hmm. you know, fitness is a big part of that, but, but, um, what that comes down to is like, you can eat a reasonably good diet and get most of what you need. The, yeah. The challenge is there are certain things that can really bring the neurotransmitters support to the next level. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about foods, pickled foods and so forth, kimchi, yeah. um, sauerkraut, pickles, things like that. That's very common in terms of eating throughout many parts of the world. Right. It's actually really great for not only your gut health and supporting the gut brain connection through serotonin synthesis, but, um, but also for things like the GABA system, which manages overwhelm. Mm -hmm. So for us, when I, when I had the support through nutrition, I was like, why isn't this a thing? Yeah. Why don't people know more about this? And how can we concentrate that nutrition in a way where people could just pop a chew yeah. and get it versus, you know, eat a, bowl of kimchi yeah <laughs> well, not to say that's great but yeah. but not not at not at every not every day well i i hate pickles so maybe that explains some of my my uh anxiety over the years um but yeah it is a quick eat like quick easy answer they come in uh like little packets right and it's they're just chewables that yeah where, and where can you get them pim.com you can get it at sprouts you can get it in the in the midwest at fresh time in the south at heb um, we'll be in a, a lot more stores next year. Awesome. Uh, ordering online, pim.com. And we'll definitely have links in, in all of our videos and descriptions because I want to help, you know, support that as much as we can. Um, this thought just came to my mind and I know I'm going to get you out of here in a little bit. Um, you know, as someone that's, you know, struggled a lot with, with mental health, depression, suicidal thoughts, and the alcohol abuse, it is really inspiring for someone to, um, be six years sober and uh, go through a bunch of challenges and deal with trauma in life. Um, you know, hearing the story about you and your wife and experiencing very, very similar trauma in your family together. Um, surrounding people that can support you, like having people surrounded you that can support you is a huge, huge key. But I think one of the biggest things is looking in the mirror and wanting to make that change. Um, would you agree that that's like just such an empowering thing when you can realize, Hey, I can do this. It just takes, you know, one step at a time to do that. Yeah. 
I, the thing is, is journeys are made up of steps. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very goal oriented. Um, but what I realize is that it, it starts with every day, mm -hmm. any goal. Yeah. And there's a series of choices that you can make that compound over time. Yeah. Good things and bad things. And so for me, it's about making good choices at compound, continuing to eat well, continuing to take care of my body, um, through things like fitness. Yeah. Um, in conjunction with that, uh, nurturing our relationships, relationships compound. Yeah. You know, deep, meaningful relationships are, um, I, I don't want to say they're few and far between, but if nurtured correctly can be the most sustaining things, especially mm -hmm. during challenging times. Yep. I agree with you hundred percent on that. I'm going to ask you one final thing. And then if you got anything you want to add, please do. Um, I always ask people at the end of, of the podcast advice for someone that wants to follow in their footsteps. You know, I have a lot of athletes, NFL players, musicians. Um, would you consider yourself mental health advocate now, or I know you did, you know, you've worked in, in film and done producing too. Um, I'll let you answer advice to whoever you want to give it to. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, most of my backgrounds in consumer technology, Yeah. you know, w working for various companies, every, every, every company from, or companies from electronic arts where I was making video games to yeah. Con Condé Nast where I was focused on, you know, media deals and so forth. But, um, yes, I identify as an advocate and, um, and for me, for folks who are interested in advocating for things they're passionate about, the key thing is, is focusing first on yourself, mm -hmm. really establishing those daily rituals to support your mental health. I frame it as mental hygiene. Yeah. Mental hygiene is nutrition, fitness, mindfulness, meditation, community support, um, potentially a spiritual practice. Yeah. All these things coalesce into ways in which you can find that foundation that enable you to establish a compounding approach. Yep. You know, because and, and the earlier you can engage in a compounding approach, the more, you know, the value of your contributions in the world can compound over time. Yeah. And I think that the common theme throughout this entire episode has been taking care of yourself first with your mental health or your mental, um, I almost said mental hygiene, right? That's, yeah. That, that's the phrase we want to use. Um, it's, it's really powerful and it's super true. I know for me, you've said it is for you too. Zach, thank you so much for coming on the mental thank game. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. We'll see everybody right back here next week. And I can't thank Zach enough for opening up about his father's mental health story and also what he's battled himself and with his family. I think it's really powerful how Zach's trying to change the world and break the stigma with mental health in his own business with Pim. Again, thank you so much to Zach and the Williams family for opening up here on The Mental Game. Next week, we are going back out to Los Angeles for another big name in Hollywood. Your one hint entertainment reporter that is your one hint and we'll see everybody right back here next week on the mental game <laughs>